I'd like to pass over to our first speaker um, of this morning, uh, Uosis Markalkas, the president of the Baltic Audiovisual Archive Council. Uosis, over to you. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today with you. And uh, what uh, I'm about to do now is I have to get the control of the slides first. Yeah, it's something I already have. Yeah. So during my presentation, uh, I would like to share the Lithuanian experience, and this will be like a more practical approach how we deal with institution and uh, the uh, right strategies. So it is important uh, to mention that uh, the most institu institution today uh, in Lithuania at the national level or at the regional level, they more or less understand the importance of the sharing uh, the content online and giving a free access and possibility to reuse the content. And uh, they realize and recognize that it is important to provide the rights information uh, along with the digital objects. So we also have the translated uh, rights statements and creative common licenses into the Lithuanian language, which is really important when they think uh, about the smaller and the regional institution where they have the professionals who don't have uh, the background in law. And sometimes you really have to encourage them to do this job. So the native language documents really help them to understand the whole thing. And uh, it didn't happen like uh, in one day or in one night, uh, what we have now. So we started uh, the projects in 2016 and uh, the institutions behind this initiative uh, are the National Library of Lithuania because uh, this is also uh, the national aggregator of the institution that uh, administrates the national aggregator portals. So they are in connection with the smaller institutions and organizations and Baltic Audiovisual Archival Council act uh, as a professional international network of experts. So support uh, in these activities is also very important and they have a support from Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Lithuania and Lithuanian Council of Culture and uh, also the Europeana uh, we have a very good professional support. It's really important uh, Then you have some ideas and you share your experience and you have a feedback and consultation on that. So it really makes uh, to move you ahead uh, and jump in new and new projects. Uh, how did we start? Uh, the whole thing is uh, that in 2016, the National Library initiated this survey. Uh, about the digital things, about the digital agendas uh, in different institutions and some part of the questions were targeted to the rights information, what is happening uh, in this, in this uh, area at the institution. And uh, we realized after the survey that uh, only less than one third of institutions were labeling the cultural heritage objects that they put online. So that means that uh, they just published uh, the objects and maybe at some point there was a disclaimer uh, somewhere on the bottom of the page uh, on the footer that please contact the institution if you are about to use the content or it was said that everything is under the copyright and that uh, wasn't uh, like a very good approach. And uh, of those one third who were labeling the content, uh, we realized that they used the public domain mark out of more than 14 options available at that time. So there was like a good idea to start something new and to figure out why this is happening. And of course, uh, the problem was that uh, the people, they knew about the right statements and they knew about the Creative Commons licenses, but they said that like, okay, we are from the memory institution, we are not lawyers, so we simply don't understand how to fit that in our daily routine. Uh, we started uh, with the first project, uh, so our idea was uh, to develop and to publish the labeling panel specifically designed for the people working uh, at the libraries, museums and archives and uh, the initial idea was to have like a 
20 or 30 pages, uh, but we ended up in over 100 pages on the PDF that you can also print uh, on your printer. And uh, you don't have to go through all document. You can you can go just the specific chapters, but it was still not very comfortable. So our next uh, project focused then on interactive tool, which was based uh, on the labeling manual and the interactive tool helped uh, like the people working at memory institutions to make a decision. So you have a question, you answer yes or no to the question when you have next specific question and it just fosters uh, to make a decision which license or the statement you can apply to the content you are digitizing and publishing online. And of course, uh, if you need some more advice, so you can be redirected to the labeling manual. Uh, that was not enough. And uh, as I mentioned already at the beginning that uh, we figure out that uh, the problem was language and especially in small institutions that people said, how can I uh, get this specific statement uh, to the content and I don't really understand very well what is it about. So when with a big support from Europeana, we translated the right statements in uh, Lithuanian and it also help uh, end user who are coming to the aggregator portal and who are browsing through the content. So the end user, like non-professionals, uh, they can also read this information in a native language and this is really useful. Uh, along with the initiative, uh, we also created some video explainers, like two, three minute uh, uh, videos and we published that on YouTube and on a library website uh, because what we realized that this is a medium uh, which is comfortable for most of the users. The text is good and then you have a specific problem so you can go and read but uh, when you just want to engage people to join the initiative uh, it's uh, really important to communicate in their language and the videos is uh, what they already used. So the videos depend on the audiences so one is more for creator one is the professionals but it also works uh, quite well for us uh, but i think uh, in my opinion that the most important thing is the training uh, we did a series of training uh, with each project and it was a really really important part because of the one thing is then you publish documents you publish tools recommendation and videos but for communities, it is really important to meet the people behind and uh, to interact with them. And then they know that someone really cares uh, about the initiative and they have uh, the contacts they can ask later the questions. And uh, we see a really big shift when we started uh, four years ago. So during the workshops, uh, the people, they looked like, you know, the deer in the headlights, the big guys, they didn't uh, understand <laughs> a lot of things. And now when we run uh, the workshops, we have a lot of practical activities uh, like uh, trying to identify the rights of specific objects and label them. So now they have a good questions and you can see that like uh, over the years, uh, like knowledge increased in this and like now there is no passion for them, but it is important to share and to label the content and to provide the rights information. Then they have a really good questions. We also can learn from them. And uh, what is uh, happening right now? So we continue working um, in this field. So we are about uh, to recommend the Europeana Publishing Framework as a national recommendation for an institution digitizing the content because that they provide the content to national aggregator portal, then it goes to Europeana, and this is a good measure to keep the quality. And as you know, like when you talk about the quality, you have. Uh, the labeling uh, exercise somewhere in the recommendation. So this is like a recommendation, but we believe that uh, the institutions will really use and uh, it's also good to evaluate your work, what you are doing when you have this. Uh, earlier before me, there was a presentation about the DSM directive. So we are also actively working on that and uh, the role is taken by the Ministry of Culture. They have one big a general group for the implementation of the directive, but we also have a smaller working uh, group which is formed of uh, representative of different institutions, uh, libraries, uh, museums, and archives. So we meet uh, online uh, or on-site, depending on the regulation from the government. But 
this is quite an active uh, group and we are lobbying for the best we can get uh, for the heritage uh, sector. And uh, I mentioned the shift uh, in the training and in the audiences that they now are better educated and understand uh, the field. Uh, so the national aggregator also started uh, to label the content which was already digitized in 2019. And so far, the progress is that uh, we have about 10% of the content uh, on the portal already labeled and the right information uh, important for the users. So I think I am running out of my 10 minutes and this is what I was going to tell you today. So thank you for listening. Wonderful, thank you, Joses. That was um, that was really interesting. Um, I know there's been a few questions um, being passed through the chat. Um, as I said at the beginning, we will aim to answer some of them um, at the end if we have time. So I encourage you to stay tuned. Um, and if we can't answer them um, in the session, we will um, find a way to answer them um, after the session. So next up, I'd like to um, pass the, the baton over to my colleague at Europeana, Ariadne Matas, and uh, who's gonna share with you um, what we've been doing around capacity building on copyright. Ariadne. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, so yes, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the main three ways uh, in which we support the sector around copyright. And then at the very end of my presentation, I'd like to introduce you our recently published copyright strategy for the next five years. Um, and so the first way in which we support the sector is, uh, might, might seem like a very simple one, but it's extremely important for us. And that's at the forefront of what Europeana does, which is connecting people with each other. As you know, Europeana is not just the foundation, we're an ecosystem uh, based on three pillars, the foundation running the operations, but then also the network association and the aggregators forum are fundamental pillars that, that make what Europeana currently is. And so when I say that Europeana connects professionals, Europeana is essentially uh, connected. So we are the sector and everything we do is for the sector, but also done by the sector with constant input, uh, which cre creates a multiplier effect and really a good synergy uh, among the three organizations. Um, and so more specifically, through the European Network Association, we've got uh, six communities, the communicators, impact, education, copyright tech and research communities that allow us to bring individual expertise and, and bring them together across sectors and even across borders. And so more particularly around copyright, we create tools and spaces for professionals to be able to exchange best practice, thoughts, ideas, or even lessons learned. Um, for instance, we um, support the creation of task forces like the one that uh, Joseph that you just heard is currently leading on how to develop a, a guide for the labeling of cultural heritage so professionals interested on that particular topic can join forces into creating a product that, they, that can then uh, support professionals across Europe. We also create online spaces for people to connect, such as through webinars that we're currently organizing with other organizations, or even through the obviously European uh, annual conference. We also share and connect people by, by sharing some great examples that we think can inspire other institutions. So for instance, uh, the approach that the British Film Institute is taking to clearing rights, which has proved very successful for their institution. Um, and so everything that the corporate community does is uh, sort of steered by a group of people. Some of their faces will sound familiar to you because they're going to be speaking today. And um, uh, they are the ones deciding the direction that the activities of the corporate community take. For instance, they do so by embedding the priorities they think are most important in an annual work plan uh, that is updated on an annual basis. And for instance, for the uh, 2020 work plan of the corporate community, they decided that, that the aspirations of this group of people should be to support each other, um, navigate copyright in collections, for instance, by sharing best practice on how to clear rights, to help each other advocate for adequate institutional support around copyright so that from the director to everyone else, uh, there's awareness on the need to, to deal with copyright from the get-go and to provide guidance around how to contribute to adequate legal frameworks in their countries so that people is aware of the changes that are going on through, for instance, the DSM directive and know how or when to intervene. And so the European 
uh, copyright community also extensively. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to click. Oop, I went a bit too far. Um, and so the European copyright community is also more and more connected to one of the other pillars uh, in the European ecosystem, which is the European Aggregators Forum. Because as I will tell you a bit later, they, there's also uh, struggles around copyright that we see coming uh, through the Aggregator Forum. And so the support that the copyright community provides for the sector uh, can definitely be great support for those sharing data with Europeana. And effectively, we might be reaching the same institutions. The goal is just to be able to support those in the heritage sector across Europe that need uh, copyright support, being through the, the tunnel of aggregation or through the copyright community. And so another way in which we support the sector is by identifying trends and needs. By clearly identifying what those consist on, we can then clearly communicate them or to stakeholders that need to be aware or even look for solutions that can be um, commonly be commonly used by professionals across Europe. So for instance, through the European Copyright Community, we've conducted surveys. The, the last one was conducted towards the end of uh, last year. And we wanted to ask professionals in that community what their biggest struggles were when it comes to copyright. And so it won't come as a surprise that uh, one of them was the lack of copyright knowledge, which unfortunately eventually leads to professionals not feeling empowered to make copyright decisions and making less content available online that maybe could be legally made available online. It's just that lack of copyright knowledge leads to less confidence in, in, taking, in making the copyright decisions. And then second, a difficulty of identifying the copyright status of collection items. That's also a very obvious one, but as you know, if an audiovisual archives needs to clear the rights of an audiovisual work, that means many rights holders and many layers of rights that need to be identified before they know who holds the rights and whether the work can be made available online. Another way in which we can identify trends is by us as Europeana being a mirror of the sector. So the pains of the sector are our own pains as a platform that gathers cultural heritage from across Europe. And so this is a graph that shows how the 20th century black hole is a reality in Europeana collections. So you see that uh, towards the mid 20th century, there's a big gap in digital cultural heritage being made available through our platforms. Um, that's a graph from a study that we did a couple of years ago, and maybe it would be interesting to, to update it, but I fear that this black hole has not yet been closed. Um, and so the fact that we have this black hole at Europeana means that it exists in institutions across Europe. Um, sorry, the clicking sometimes takes a little bit long. Um, and so another way in which we understand uh, the trends that or, or challenges that the sector is facing with is um, through the use of right statements, which is um, this little piece of information that you see below the image, in this case, the public domain mark. At Europeana, we work with the right statements from the Right Statements Consortium, with uh, Creative Commons tools and Creative Commons licenses. And we ask everyone sharing digital objects with Europeana to mark them with one of these statements. This is really, really important so that the end user knows the extent to which a content can be used or not. Um, rather than asking them to dive into complex copyright terms, if you add that complexity to the fact that we're in, in a multilingual environment, uh, for many users, understanding uh, what a work from another country, um, whether it is copyrighted or not, uh, that would be impossible. And so we really strive to make copyright information very simple to the user and ask our data partners to added, like, correctly mark works uh, with the right statement that identifies the copyright status and, and the possibilities to reuse the content. However, because we keep receiving all this information, we also see how it's not always accurate. Uh, in a study conducted a couple of, uh, in 2018, we saw how only 61.8% of these right statements used on Europeana were accurately applied. Um, and so, well, meaning that some of the rest of the digital objects are not accurately labeled, which is extremely misleading to the user. Um, we've had conversations with aggregators to understand where this comes from. And to a large extent, there's, there's many other reasons, but uh, there seems to still be an underlying problem of understanding whether a work is protected by copyright or not and who holds the rights. And then second, understanding how these tools work and the extent to which they relate to the copyright status of the work. So when 
to they need to apply them. Um, we also had conversations with aggregators to understand what other copyright challenges they faced when sharing data with your pen. And so what you see on the screen is just a, a screenshot of uh, another Mentimeter voting with it with them to try to understand whether uh, there were any, uh, uh, whether they had enough, enough copyright support in their institution to make these copyright decisions that they need to make when sharing data with Europeana. And as you can see, it's very mixed. Um, so probably there's not enough support for them yet. Um, and so then a third way in which we build capacity is by providing direct support. For instance, a very simple one, but still very important one is information sharing. So we want to make sure that the sector is aware of everything that's going on around copyright. Uh, so through our newsletters, mailing lists, uh, social media channels, or even online events, we keep them up to date with uh, important celebrations, important events such as this one, or even um, important trends like how the DSM directives transposition is progressing in, in member states. We also uh, define, adopt, and encourage people to adopt good practice. So for instance, the European Public Domain Charter establishing that works in the public domain should, and should remain in the public domain once digitized or the public domain usage guidelines which encourage users to properly attribute um, the author, uh, the, the providing institution and show respect for the work uh, when they use the content is um, some of the standards that we have, some of the good practice that we have defined and adopted ourselves and encourage people to, to also follow. And uh, to make this work, we also uh, create standards that we use ourselves and uh, support in their sustainability. So for instance, we are co-founders of the Right Statements Consortium. And with international partners in this consortium, we encourage the use of standardized expression of rights information in the cultural heritage sector. So that these pieces of information, of simplified information that have been so useful for us can be used by anyone in the sector, anywhere in the world. And um, the last thing we actively do to provide support is by some sort of training. So I was telling you about these conversations we had with aggregators where we noticed some of the struggles they deal with when they share data with us around copyright. And so we've created a series of webinars to really go deep into the particularities that they face and, and tackle their problems. Or we are also organizing some online conversations with our colleagues at the Museum Computer Network and the Open Glam Initiative on particular topics that we think are of interest uh, for the sector. So for instance, uh, on sharing collections on social media when everyone went on lockdown and museums uh, started sharing so much content online, we explored together and had conversations around the, the copyright questions that might arise. And so I've got, I, if I can have just one last minute, I would like to briefly introduce you our copyright strategy, because even though we're conducting all these efforts, there's obviously many challenges that remain and uh, we cannot solve them alone. So we've created a strategy uh, that ex explains our aims for the coming years, what we're gonna be doing in copyright in very broad terms. And hopefully this provides transparency and allows any institutions that might want to engage with us uh, to have some clarity on what we're aiming at um, to see whether maybe we can work on that together. To develop this strategy, we started by trying to understand the environment we operate in through the um, several surveys and conversations we've had with the sector. Um, so we understand that while technologies advance and open up many possibilities for the heritage sector, there's still many legal challenges that arise when the sector tries to take advantage of these technological possibilities. We still see that there's a, a big lack of, of copyright expertise, um, which leads to unwillingness to take risks and less digital cultural heritage as a consequence is, be, is made available online. We also see that Europe has clearly expressed the name of fostering the digitization and online accessibility of the cultural material. And maybe partly due to that, we also see some progress being made on respecting the public domain, also thanks to many networks that are, are pushing this forward. And so with this landscape in mind, we identified um, our vision for copyright. We want to see a sector that is empowered to deal with copyright and so that contributes to accessible and reusable digital cultural heritage. To do that in the coming five years, we will be focusing on three priorities. The first one is to follow actively and, and eventually get involved in 
evolving policy and practice because we want to see a sector that understands policy and the impact that they have um, and that they also follow evolving practices and feel empowered to participate and influence them. Our second priority um, will be to reach a higher quality of rights information because we strive to support uh, Europeana data partners in giving users clear and simple information on the extent to which Europeana resources can be used. And hopefully this can have a ripple effect and support people or institutions not necessarily sharing data with Europeana as well and raise the, the knowledge that the sector has on, on using these tools. And the third one, and, and that's where I finish, is uh, a simple one and extremely important one, uh, building capacity for the sector because we need a cultural heritage sector that is better prepared to make adequate copyrighted decisions as well as other legal and ethical decisions. Uh, so I look forward to further conversations with all of you and thank you very much for uh, listening. Super, thank you Ariadna. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna move straight on to our third speaker um, of the morning, uh, Anka Scherholz, Legal Officer for Bilkunst. Anka, I believe the controls of the presentation have been passed to you. Over to you. Anka, I believe you're still on mute. Okay, better, better like this, you can hear There we are, now. now we can hear you. Sorry for that. Well, I hope I, I'm not so quick in speaking as Ariadna is, is, although I'm fairly quick usually, I try to get you through it as, as soon as possible. Um, just briefly, we are already at the presence and I'd like to actually go back to the past again. I now hear everything gets too big. Um, well, what the cultural heritage institutions, when they first had to face um, copyright issues, that was when photocopying came up, because the physical user in the physical archive, library, museum, whatever, trying to um, uh, make handmade uh, excerpts, copies, or whatever has never been a copyright problem. The copyright problems came up when the photocopying machines uh, were, were used in the libraries. And I think that the solution found in most of the European countries to provide for a private copy scheme that remunerates the authors through op machine and operator levies whilst not controlling the user in the, in the copies made is the, is the system that, sh that should lead us the way to the future too. And, and in fact, as we'll see it is. Um, same applies to public lending when publi where, where publishers were rightfully, publishers and authors actually were rightfully addressing the topic that uh, public lending uh, has an impact on the primary market. Um, so uh, uh, the, the interests, the different interests have to be balanced and it, it's been balanced through um, public lending schemes, which are um, compulsory throughout the, la the, the um, union. And of course there is with the digital changes a, a, a certain public pressure on the CHAs to make their content available and the major problems in rights clearing up to now. Could you, could you switch me on, please? Next slide. Because I don't, I, I, I can't switch on. Can, can you switch on the next slide? <laughs> um, no, the, 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 the presence first. Um, I mean, this, this pressure of, on public, institu public um, heritage institutions to make all their collections available, which is a fair question and which is I think both in the interest of the institutions of the right holders and of the general public um, was just facing this made this this problem of copyright clearance and this is actually where the 20th century black hole comes from because most works of the 20th century are still in, in copyright protection and clearance rights clearance has been extremely difficult. So um, the reaction from the um, CIH community was often a high level of frustration leading to the conclusion that copyright is not fit for the digital um, uh, setting and that copyright is rather an obstacle than um, 
a tool for for authors and 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 publishers to um, generate an income on the works used. Unfortunately, the legislators too fail to offer reasonable solutions um, until the DSM directive, where which changes, I think, the setting a lot. For the, for the authors and the other right holders, actually the situation as it is with the 20th century black hole is extremely frustrating because authors certainly want to have their, their rights being visible. But in this whole chain of digitization where, you're, um, where everybody is more or less, be, uh, no, everybody involved is being paid for the author. I think it's only fair if the authors expect a certain remuneration too. Um, one problem we are facing here is that in the Anglo-Saxon context, um, collective licensing solutions don't have a really a base both in, in society and, and in the legal uh, setting. But I think the future brings us further because the, can we go on to the future slide? Um, this out of work, out of commerce work, um, Article Eight replaces to a very far extent the fairly dis, uh, dysfunctional orphan works directive. And I think most most of the cultural heritage institutions um, haven't even tried to go into diligent search because it's obvious that you are wasting resources. And the worst case that can happen is that you actually find a rights holder. So um, the out of commerce uh, uh, regime um, will actually cover most of the orphaned works because if the work is orphaned, it usually is out of commerce too. Um, the good thing is that the collective licenses will have extended effect. So if a um, collecting society is representative for a certain repertoire and the needed sets of rights, um, licenses granted to, to cultural heritage institutions will also cover um, non-members and thereby um, uh, a maximum of legal security um, hopefully will be achieved. Uh, one important thing is actually that there is, a draw, is an opt-out um, possibility for um, non-members of collecting societies and this is something that we have included always in, in, in our, we have, we have granted some licenses which are covering um, also authors which are not members of, of um, our um, CMO system. And actually, if you offer them a dropout, that's, uh, that, that gives them a, a certain legal security to, to say, if someone comes and say, I want to drop out, then as a collecting society, you can say, thank God, there you are. First, we've got money for you, and then you can decide whether you want to stay in the system or not. And giving the, the um, non-represented right holders this chance to do so really keeps the, keeps the um, opts out extremely low. So don't, don't worry that uh, there is an opt out option it won't be extremely relevant in practice. I'm, practice, I'm quite sure. And the other um, major step forward by, the, by Article 8 is that CMOs who granted uh, licenses to cultural heritage institutions um, can, uh, no, <laughs> not the CMOs. The law itself says that these licenses granted by CMOs will have cross-border effect. So you won't have to control the IP address of the people accessing um, the, the um, websites. And the whole th the um, Article 8, this out of commerce works rules, um, actually is backed by the general um, possibility for collective rights management organizations to grant extended collective licenses. And um, this is extremely important to, well, in, in any um, license on out of commerce works, there might be, we haven't started it yet, but, but it's always with the legal um, licenses provided for in, in the law that we see there 
there are some gaps between the legal license in the law and the needs of the cultural heritage institutions. Um, and these gaps, they, they might re, um, refer to, to certain ancillary rights. They might also um, refer to, to, to certain aspects of the repertoire. All this can be covered by um, the extended collective licenses. Um, so it's really important that this would be uh, implemented too. So the big question I think that you all have is um, what is about technical protection? Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Probably most of, of those working in, in cultural heritage institutions are aware of the lawsuit between Foggy Bildkunst and digital, uh, German Digital Library. Um, for those who who are not completely familiar with the case, I just recap the background. Um, we had a licensing contract negotiated as early as 2014. And, and the idea was that there is a central clearance of um, a central license granted to German Digital Library, which, which should cover um, all the aggregators um, contributing in, to German Digital Library. Um, and then the European Court of Justice decided in its best water decision that framing or inline linking, and I mean, I know that the, that the wording, that the vocabulary in both has changed and is a bit unclear. What I mean is you put an inline link on your website and, and the content of, a, of a, a third server appears in, in this frame, in this content, in, in this context without uh, making it obvious to the user that this particular content has been retrieved from another um, server and is not an own material. So um, we uh, were afraid of massive abuse of the of the visual material, and were actually afraid that we that uh, no there would be no online licensing thing any more of, um, of of fine art content at least where if um, the uh, contemporary art collections were thoroughly digitized and made available in the, in the German digital library. So we said we will, we, we will still be happy to, to give you a license, but only on the condition that technical protection is implemented against framing. Um, it was a model case because we both knew technical protection against framing is not as easy. Uh, well, it is easy, but it is not easy on a on a multi level system where the uh, where where the, the the portals are framing down to the contributing institutions websites, and um, that's why German Digital Library sued Foggy Bildkunst for an unconditional license. The case went up to the European Court of Justice. And actually, only some days ago, on September 10th, the um, Attorney General Spuna um, to the European Court of Justice published his voting. And he said, other than the, the European Court of Justice said before, that a di distinction must be made be between cl clickable links and between automatic inline links, saying that clickable links should be allowed and not controlled by the copyright holder, but that automatic inline links actually need a separate permission of the right holders. And he came up with a series of really strong persuasive arguments um, for the European Court of Justice to convince him to revise, review um, the former jurisdiction um, given. So, our big hope is that the court will follow the, gen the, the attorney general's voting. That, uh, that would mean that for automatic inline links, um, the user would not, uh, the, the right holder would not control, use control over uh, the works and the rights once um, there has been a licensed first, a, a lawful first publication by, by, by a licensee. And if it happens, uh, and if, if, if that would be the case, technical protection actually would not be necessary. So we strongly hope that 
the case turned the uh, the European case the Court of Justice um, ruling. Thank you. Um, yeah. May I just uh, briefly interrupt you to um, thank you for also explaining um, this far. Would it be possible that you um, uh, move to your final um, remarks? Yes. Thanks, thank slide. You very much. Next slide. I, um, since since the um, whole seminar also addresses legislators in the member states, um, I would just like to line out what we think is really important if the if the DSM directive should be a success, and this is mainly that Article um, eight or ten out of commerce work should be implemented as close as possible. Uh, should be implemented, and it should the implementation should stay to the text of the directive. That out of commerce was licensing should be backed by um, the possibility um, of extended collective licensing by implementing Article 12. Then um, to facilitate licensing, CMOs should be strengthened. The authors and right holders need an incentive to join that so, so that in areas where the CMOs are weak or where they they are not yet representative you, you would need the ones you would need them to have, be the one stop shop to license cultural heritage institutions mediation processes would be helpful but i think the major thing is rights clearance means um, paying a, a license fee and legislators have to um, supply chis with su sufficient funding not only for the digitization processes, but also to be able to remunerate right holders. So that's, I'm through with it. Thank, thank you and happy to have questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anka. Um, I think what this is showing us is there's so many interesting case studies to share from across the sector, from all different perspectives. We certainly all need to make more time um, to give um, to give our platforms to presentations like yours and Ariadna's in your offices. But now I would like to hand straight over to Fred Saunderson from the National Library of Scotland to share with us some of his practices. Fred. Okay, good uh, Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. And um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me along. And thank you to the speakers who've already gone so far. It's, it's been quite a fascinating um, morning, morning already. And I hope to add to that for you. Um, so with luck, I've got control of the screen here and uh, I will be able to move us forward. Yes, I can. Apologies for that. Um, so yes, um, I want to talk about um, a piece of work that uh, uh, the National Library of Scotland uh, and the National Library of Wales have um, collaborated on um, developing and um, implementing uh, in both of our organisations. Um, We've been looking at uh, uh, my colleague, my colleague Davith, uh, uh, the National Library of Wales, uh, and myself have been looking at a series of problems. Um, that we noticed were, were common to, to our organizations and to, to a lot of our peers um, to do with uh, the copyright uh, challenges um, that, that um, our peers and our colleagues face um, in their activities. Um, so for example, some of the points we've already sort of discussed this morning, but, but simply uncertainty around um, the status of copyright or how copyright functions, this, this perhaps lack of, of, of access to expertise within the organization and, and what that leads to, as Ariadna was noting in her talk earlier. Um, we, we were finding that this leads to disjointed approaches within uh, organizations, but also across organizations. So uh, sporadic access to expertise, sporadic um, sort of certainty uh, and confidence with copyright naturally leads to, to, to different uh, and, and sort of differential approaches to copyright and, and, and certainty and confidence, um, which leads ultimately to, to, to different implementation of projects, whether it's digitization or, or other forms of access. Uh, we also found that, that specifically within our organizations, every time a new project, digitization or, or, or access, uh, you doing something with collections came up, every time a new project came along, a sort of new copyright uh, risk assessment was being undertaken. There was always an element of copyright risk to consider, uh, or, or very often, unless you're dealing with uh, a very clear-cut material, which is uh, not the norm for our collections. 
And every, every time there was something new, you know, we, we were thinking afresh, that, okay, well, let's talk about the copyright risk, let's develop a risk assessment. Uh, and, and that felt quite isolated. And there, there was no consistency uh, across projects uh, or across teams uh, within a single organization. And we're reacting as well to sort of feedback we've had, you know, this is a direct quote here from our colleague, you know, copyright is a minefield. And I think that's absolutely correct. Um, it, it's a minefield within a country and it's a minefield across uh, countries, of course, as we start to look at other regimes. Uh, so it, it's a real challenge. So these are the problems we were, we were seeking to, to react to. Uh, what we did was we developed a framework, a copyright risk assessment framework. Um, So what we developed is, is, is in short, a, a copyright diagnostic tool that applies minimal collection data to a standardized uh, assessment framework. It, in other words, uh, based on specifically UK copyright law, we developed a framework that integrates guidance from the UK Intellectual Property Office and from rightstatements.org to allow formalization of copyright risk, accept, risk acceptance at organizational level. So what we were looking to do with, with the framework we've developed, which I'll talk through in more detail in a second and, and show you, was to bring together the, the actual rules. Um, so, so in our case, this is UK law specific uh, because the, the rules can vary uh, between countries. There, there's a lot of harmonization as we know, uh, but there's also a lot of, of non-harmonization. Uh, a fantastic or, or bad example, if you want, is, is the situation we have in the UK with what we call 2039 works, which is the situation that in general, older unpublished works uh, remain in copyright until the end of the year 2039 in the UK, even if they're incredibly old. Um, so this is a real challenge for archival sectors, for example, um, in the UK. Uh, how, how on earth do you track a copyright owner from a 17th century manuscript? So, so taking the UK law uh, and then integrating um, published guidance from, from our intellectual property office, uh, um, sort of um, uh, responses to consultations that they had had and, and information that they had published uh, guidelines that they developed, so not the actual law itself, uh, so taking the law and then some of the, the softer guidance on top of that, and then combining that with some of uh, what we felt was were some of the most useful tools that were, were out there at the moment, namely uh, right statements, uh, because those allow for, for the vagaries of copyright so well, uh, the uncertainty. We sort of take these three elements together uh, into a tool that, that we felt would allow our organizations to structure these risk acceptance and risk assessment processes across projects. So each project digitizing materials was looking at content uh, uh, and, and there was degrees of uncertainty about the copyright status of content. Uh, and we felt that this tool would allow the organization to say, we understand that this is the sort of the, the level of copyright risk accept, uh, acceptance. Before I show you uh, the, the tool and, and hopefully uh, elucidate that a lot more, uh, I always want to clarify what this tool isn't. And what we haven't developed is a tool that tells organizations to take particular risks or suggests what types of risks to take. Rather, we are reacting to what I think um, really is the reality. Uh, and I'll just stress again that there are risks uh, in a vast majority of um, situations, what you are dealing with with copyright is, is you're dealing with risk in, in our sector, especially when, uh, you know, the organizations that we work for, national libraries, where there are tens of millions of items, uh, and, and the, the amount of information about those items um, is, is incredibly small. Uh, we, we don't deal in the hundreds, we deal in the thousands and the millions. And uh, th there's going to be risk when you're dealing in that scale. So we wanted a framework that doesn't tell you to take risks, but helps you if you choose to take risks, to take those in a structured, uh, consistent way that aligns to the policy, aligns to the legislation. Uh, and our, our framework, uh, this is essentially how it works. And I'll show the actual framework to you in a second. Uh, essentially what it does is it takes in um, four pieces of information or up to four pieces of information about an item. The, the publication date or the date that it was created if it's unpublished. Just the fact of whether you can identify the author or not. Is there someone named uh, in your records or in reasonably available records as the creator or creators of that work? Yes or no. Is it a published work? Uh, that obviously has an impact on copyright duration. And uh, a sort of fourth point, which is a little bit more of a judgment call, possibly, but was it created with commercial intent? Was the original item distributed with the means possibly of, of um, or the purpose of 
um, being uh, for commercial remuneration, um, because that is a sort of risk factor. Uh, and we've weighted the framework to, if you don't know uh, about the commercial intent, you default to assuming that their work was created with commercial intent. But if you know that it wasn't, um, if it was, you know, it was distributed uh, freely, perhaps, uh, we think it's reasonable that that would maybe reduce your risk uh, level and therefore you can, you can accommodate that. So you put in these factors that you've got. The idea here is that we're using the absolute bare minimum of information that, that we have, you know, coming back to the tens of millions of items, the bare minimum of information that you, you might need. Uh, we're hoping to get all of this information from our catalog. We're working on automating that at the moment. You take these, these points, um, and then you go through the assessment stage. And at this point, this isn't actually doing a copyright assessment. This is simply, do you want to do a copyright assessment or not? Um, so again, this is because this is just about structuring your risk acceptance. Uh, so are you going to, with the, the points there, are you going to undertake a risk assessment? Uh, sorry, are you going to undertake a, a copyright assessment of the content? Are you going to try and find out more information about the author, the rights holder, and so on, and, and determine whether it is or is not in copyright, and if you can or cannot get permission. Uh, if you're not going to do that, you've got a much higher risk in most cases. If you are going to do that, then we have a series of outcomes. Either you were successful, in which case you, your answer is clear cut, or you went through a process, you were unsuccessful, uh, and you now have a, a risk still, but possibly a lower risk than if you had done no assessment at all. And at the end, you get a risk value based, uh, a comparative risk based on what you've done and the information you've put in. Uh, we also recommend a particular right statement that you use uh, from rightstatements.org and we offer a URI for each outcome so that you can retro convert your process so that down the line in your metadata you can record this is how we arrived at this particular right statement. Switching slides, hopefully. Yeah, so very, th this, is, this is what the framework looks like. Uh, I wanted to show it right near the end here because it is so, uh, there's just so much to it and I, I can't talk through it all in the time that I've got. But uh, the logic here, as you see with the arrows, it works left from right. You start with the, the age of your content and you work across uh, and based on the information that you have available, you will reach a series of outcomes. And no matter how much information you do or don't have about your item, you will reach a particular outcome. That outcome will give you uh, towards the right, it will give you a right statement uh, and it will give you in the middle of the colored column, it will give you a, a comparative risk. It is up to your organization if you're adopting this framework to choose to accept or not accept any particular level of risk. Some things are obviously risk-free. If you've got permission, there's no risk. Uh, some things are very high risk, very contemporary material uh, that you have no, you've done no assessment for. You probably are not gonna accept the risk of doing anything with that content. But in the middle ground, you may want to develop uh, an approach to, to, to your content where you feel like you can accept lower levels of risk. This framework should allow you to structurally uh, accept lower levels or even medium, medium levels, whatever your organization feels is appropriate, levels of risk uh, in a structured way and in a way that you can record in your metadata. This is the right statement we arrived at. This is the risk that was involved at the time. Uh, and you can retrograde the process later and understand why you thought it was suitable levels of risk uh, uh, to, to, to make that content available at the particular time. Um, I'm just changing slides. Apologies, the slide change, change is, is just very slow. It's gone ahead. Uh, I won't talk through the examples, but I've put up some examples just to show that, that, that the sort of different types of outcomes you can get to. You can get, based on different information, you can either get a, you know, a straight risk output based on the information available this item is going to be this particular risk to proceed with digitizing and making available you can get a public domain output um, you know if you have the information available that that makes it clear that the item is out of copyright and you can get this sort of optional at the bottom where the information you've given you have a series of options you can either undertake a further assessment and the framework talks about how you might want to do that to get more information uh, and maybe reduce your risk because you've sort of you've gone through some more due diligence, uh, or you don't want to take any further steps. Uh, in which case, your risk might be higher, but your decision might be to simply not proceed with doing anything with the content. Uh, allows you to sort of prioritize your uh, your use of resources to content that you can maybe realistically clear uh, and obtain a, a lower risk for. 
I have already clicked the button for the next slide. So I'm really hoping that it moves on to the next slide before I finish speaking, but it hasn't. Uh, yes, I can skip that. This is just to say that, um, that the framework has been accepted uh, by both the organizations that we now use them as part of our mass digitization processes. Uh, and I've just put um, uh, a link to the framework here as well as a, a, a QR code for it. I know that the tiny CC link can be quite temperamental. It is case sensitive. Um, but I think the the, UR, the uh, QR code should work. So in a, in a nutshell, and I've probably gone way over time, in a nutshell, this is the Copyright Risk Assessment Framework uh, that we, we've developed um, and, and we are now integrating as, as a fundamental tool of our mass digitization process. Um, uh, and I hope that, um, that that you have a chance to look at it and, and maybe find it useful for either yourselves or your colleagues. The, the more organizations that are using this, the better. Um, all I will say is that it is specific to the UK copyright framework at the moment, um, but but one of the things we would love to do is try and develop that or work with, with colleagues to develop that for other um, national frameworks in Europe. Excellent. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, as I said, we don't have um, time for questions now, um, but my colleagues at Europeana have been uh, talking amongst ourselves, how can we actually um, make sure that we answer these questions that have been raised through the Q&A um, and through the chat. Um, and so we will arrange for um, a, a series of blogs to follow this webinar that also allows the speakers to address some of the questions that have been posed um, both in this webinar but also in the, in the session that follows as part of the web conference. Um, so thank you very much, Fred. Um, and I'd like to um, pass over for the last 15 minutes to um, Evelyn Heidel, um, who is joining us very early in the morning from Uruguay. Um, I'd like to thank you, Evelyn, for um, getting up so early to share your experiences. Um, Evelyn joins us from uh, Creative Commons and the Open Glam Initiative. Over to you. Hi, Julia. Thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to this event. And I'm uh, very excited of being here and I'm a big fan of um, Fred's uh, copyright assessment tool. Um, so let me see if I can move my slide. There. Um, I will start by uh, sharing some definitions uh, that um, also explain uh, why Open Glam is important. So the first definition uh, probably that uh, some of you already know is um, trying to figure out what open access to cultural heritage means. Um, we do this in practice a lot, but sometimes we don't go back to uh, see what the definition of open access is, um, and especially what we are trying to convey by open access to cultural heritage, which for us, uh, for Creative Commons and Open Glam, is basically access free of restrictions to cultural heritage, and including copyright restrictions. So our first question uh, there means that or a whole um, project starts by looking into copyright. Um, and so there are like three basic facts that every mortal needs to know about copyright. So we don't like uh, go very far in history. Basically it's complicated and that's the first question. It lasts way too long, um, but at some point it expires, meaning that works at some point will enter the public domain effectively. Um, for Gram institutions, duration plus complexity uh, tends to create uh, to create attention. Um, basically, this means that they are commissioned to take works uh, to take care of works to which they don't normally own the rights to, um, and that means that they have to invest in very complicated copyright clearance and research process, copyright rights research process, in order to figure out who owns what. Um, and where the works are in the public domain or not, as uh, Fred was uh, speaking um, earlier. Um, and that basically leaves us with like free status, uh, free possible status of copyright. Um, and I'm like taking this from this screenshot from the Rights Statements Over website. Basically, we have like in copyright works, no works that don't have any copyright, and then other categories of works where we are not able to identify what's the copyright status of works. Um, and I think this is like relevant um, just to make sure that um, we sort of think uh, what are the possible uh, copyright status that works might have, um, especially because we need to be able to communicate this uh, correct copyright status accurately. Um, and this is very relevant. Uh, it's very relevant because as I, said like institutions invest a lot of time and resources in doing this uh, copyright research 
in, in order to be able to share the works with the public. Um, so it's relevant for reusers of content because it avoids confusion in, in like how they can use works. It's also important for cultural heritage professionals because it reduces the burden of like doing the same work over and over and that increases staff efficiency and also allows for future curators and future professionals to interact with the works. And it also strengthens the sharing ecosystem, like the value of the tools that we use to convey copyright status, such as Creative Commons and rights statements, as standard signals for communicating clearly about what's the copyright status of works. And here I'm putting like a bad example, which is the um, um, bust of Nefertiti um, that um, has like this plaster um, uh, base there that has a, a Creative Commons uh, by non-commercial share alike license. Uh, when the work is clearly in the public domain. And moreover, it has like some contested issues regarding its origins, and we think this is problematic. And there in the slide, you can actually access um, a blog post that we did uh, here. And importantly enough, we think that the Article 14 of the Digital Single Market Directive is going to help clarify some of these things about like how reproductions of public domain works should remain in the public domain. Um, and that's like kind of a fundamental principle um, of this communication of correct copyright uh, status, uh, because it, like public domain works should not have extra layers that then makes it into the future, like um, uh, making the work of cultural heritage professionals harder to figure out who owns what. Um, and with seen over and over that uh, there are some challenges in terms of like how open is being defined uh, for different professionals and in different contexts. So we know from the work that um, Ken Island did, uh, looking at the accuracy of um, copyright status in the European database, and we also know from the survey, um, the Open Glam survey or survey of um, open access um, practice and policy that Douglas McCarthy and Andrea Wallace did, that institutions are approaching this in very, very different ways. Um, and sometimes like this um, corporate status that they are communicating are not entirely accurate or not entirely um, um, fitting into the definition of open access for cultural heritage. And again, like this is not like, this is a problem for users that are trying to understand how they can reuse uh, this cultural heritage. Um, and basically this like leads me to like insisting on the point where like legal interoperability and machine readability are crucial for reuse and discoverability. Um, so if we don't have, uh, if we're not using um, machine readable uh, tools such as Creative Commons and um, right statements tools, then search engines and other software platforms can actually not read what's the right status of those uh, um, works, and they are not able to be retrieved by um, different um, um, search engines and other software platforms. Um, and so they are not put in front of the eyes of the public. And then legal interoperability is actually crucial because that means that um, copyright is very complex, as I was saying, but also doesn't fully work internationally or it's not like a standardized um, um, sort of law. So that's why we need like these tools um, that in a way solve some of the cross-border issues that we face whenever we are trying to uh, um, put words online. Um, and how we can, and, and this is where I'm gonna like talk a little bit about the Open Glam Initiative, which is like how we can actually try to build some consensus around what open access to cultural heritage means. Um, and what are sort of the steps that we are taking into that direction and trying to achieve a more standard definition of open uh, and insisting on the importance of using um, uh, standard tools such as Creative Commons and rights statements. Um, what we know so far um, also is that we estimate, uh, based on the survey of um, GLAM open access practice and policy that I was sharing, um, what we know is that less than 1% of institutions globally 
are doing some type of open access. Uh, this is based on the numbers being provided by the survey, which uh, counts ar around like 900 institutions doing some type of open access. And then like, um, international organizations of museums, libraries, and archives. Um, so we know this for, um, uh, we are sort of starting to come this data, which is interesting because we didn't have this data previously before, but we know that the numbers are really uh, not as um, exciting as one would think um, uh, at this point in um, time. So what we're trying to do is trying to spark a global conversation around the importance of doing open access uh, for cultural heritage and at, at, the, at the importance of uh, providing this for the general public. So we, we do this through different ways and channels. And one of the uh, channels that we have is this Twitter open, um, sorry, this Twitter account, um, at the uh, Open Glam Twitter account that we are basically inviting professionals every two weeks that are doing open access or are um, open access advocates um, inside cultural institutions to sort of share what they do, how they did it, uh, and important insights and lessons that they can share with others. Um, we also have the um, Medium publication, Open Glam, um, where we invite professionals from all over the world to share global insights into open access and cultural heritage. Um, and right now, we are actually doing a very interesting series with uh, stories from the global south and underrepresented communities. So we are having stories from Nigeria, Uganda, Brazil, um, Argentina, um, and and uh, this is a space where uh, different professionals can share uh, their experiences and some of the lessons that they learned as they were doing uh, open access. Um, and then uh, we are producing the uh, GLAM certificate, um, uh, the Creative Commons GLAM certificate. Um, Creative Commons has a training program on open access and Creative Commons licenses um, that provide a basic overview on how to use these tools. And um, we are doing now sort of the GLAM branch where we want to uh, help train cultural heritage professionals that are using uh, CC licenses on how to actually use them and apply them properly. Um, and last, the, the other thing that we're working on currently is a declaration on open access to cultural heritage where we are sort of expecting not only to like clarify some of the um, um, open access aspects that uh, CLAM institutions actually have control over, like for example, digital reproductions, um, and that they can actually release as being in the public domain, um, but some other uh, issues that we sort of think that are relevant to have a conversation around um, in terms of like how to actually deal sensitively and acknowledge some of the cultural complexities around uh, making available uh, digital reproductions of public domain, such as the colonization or um, intangible cultural heritage or issues of accessibility and open glam, um, among others. Um, and that's gonna be, um, um, up it's gonna be coming soon. Um, so watch out uh, openglam.org uh, where we will be uh, hopefully publishing uh, some more details now at some point in October. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically what I wanted to share. Um, I'm sorry that I went a little bit um, fast, but I, I didn't want to take up uh, too much time. Oh, thank you. Um, that was, again, really interesting. Um, as I said um, uh, a little bit earlier, we've had so many interesting um, uh, presentations from the speakers. I think it just shows us that we should spend more time um, and give more time to allow these presentations more space so that we can learn more from them as well. 